Their Majesties the King and Queen are back in London, and both at King's Cross Station and at Buckingham Palace, they receive a warm welcome from a large crowd. The King is looking particularly well after his holiday at Sandringham. The British Dairy Show brings the pride of the farms from all over the country to London. There's tremendous competition this year in all classes. Who said you are better than I am? A prize she goat is Jean of Delamere. But my dear, she's no lady. There are 167 entries for the butter making show. Scientific machinery may mean that the dairy maid will disappear before many years have passed. But judging by this demonstration, it'll be hard to design a machine as quick or as efficient as these ladies. Anyway, you can't take a machine out for a walk in the moonlight. Parliament reassembles after the summer recess a week earlier than usual. And the Prime Minister, Mr. Baldwin, walks across from Downing Street with his parliamentary private secretary, Mr. Geoffrey Lloyd. Members have been called back to the House to debate the foreign situation and to complete the business of this parliament before it's dissolved for the general election. So symbolically at any rate, Mr. Baldwin and his men are buckling on their swords. With all the simplicity of a country funeral, the late Duke of Buccleuch is buried in the Buccleuch Memorial Chapel at Dalkeith near Edinburgh. Sometime before the service begins, the coffin has been brought from the Duke's home in Selkirkshire. The King is represented by His Royal Highness the Duke of Gloucester here seen walking with his fiancée, Lady Alice Scott. In the church, the company includes representatives of every branch of life in Scotland, and among the flowers are roses, chrysanthemums, and lilies of the valley from the Prince of Wales. After the funeral, Lady Alice Scott and the Duke of Gloucester go to Dalkeith Palace, the Edinburgh seat of the Buccleuch family. At his palace, near Paris, the French president, Monsieur Lebrun, gives a shooting party, but doesn't take part in the shooting. Instead, he rides round the palace grounds, watching his guests have a good day's sport. Here's Monsieur Camille Blaiseau, the French Secretary of State. Monsieur Marcel Renier, the Minister of Finance. Monsieur Schlapowski, the Polish Ambassador to France. The Prince of Monaco and General Braconnier. And here's Sir George Clark, the British ambassador, said to be one of the best shots in France. Pictures which prove that even cabinet ministers and ambassadors occasionally forget the cares of state. At Croydon, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith is off at last. After several days of waiting, he starts on what he says will be his last record-breaking attempt. He intends to fly to Australia and at the same time to try to beat the record for the flight set up by his friend C.W.A. Scott. His first stop will be Marseilles, and from there he hopes to fly straight on to Baghdad. Everyone will wish him luck, but few will believe that he's really retiring. Smithy is like the old soldier. He won't die, he'll simply fade away. Italy celebrates the fifth anniversary of the formation of the youth movement by a mass physical training and boxing display in Rome. And when we say a mass boxing display, we mean it. Now watch this very carefully. Look, there's a foul. Where? Over there. And look at that fellow. He's hitting below the belt. Where? Over there. Did you see it? Well, nor did we. And nor apparently did the umpire who was watching from the stands. But the Romans who have come to see the show enjoy it mightily. Trafalgar Day is celebrated again with undiminished feeling for the memory of England's national sea hero. In London, flowers are laid as usual on the base of Nelson's monument. Among them is an anchor over six feet high from the British Legion, wreaths from His Majesty's ships and a tribute from the Navy League. The flowers will fade, but the lions will go on keeping guard, symbolizing in their strength the traditions of the Navy. At Liverpool too, Nelson's day is remembered with flowers and flags. The Lord Mayor inspects the boys of the Liverpool Seamen's Orphanage and takes the salute as the cadets of the training ship Conway march past. Nelson's memory lives on, but England seems to have forgotten that Nelson was the stoutest champion of the theory that Britain's strength lies in her navy and in her navy alone. 
The law says that every man who wants to start driving a motor vehicle on the public highway must pass a driving test, even if that vehicle happens to be a lawn roller. So Mr Charles Hester, the groundsman of Beaumont College, Old Windsor, goes through the test while the Ministry of Transport inspector watches closely to see that he gives, among other things, the correct road signals and generally knows how to handle this deadly machine, which has a maximum speed of three miles per hour. Come to watch the ceremony are the boys of Eton Motoring Club in their super sports models. At last, they've found something they can pass. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Hester's only reason for wanting a driving license is so that he can take his roller from the college to the playing fields, a distance of nearly 200 yards. In spite of the possible danger to thousands of road users all over the country by allowing this dangerous machine on the roads, Mr. Hester passes the test and will be allowed to take out his license in due course.